than 3.1 electron volts, then light can excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. So typically on the right here, we have a diagram of what uh, the band structure of a normal transparent conducting oxide looks like. So you have a nice dispersed conduction band or unoccupied states, and you have a large separation between the valence band maximum in blue here and the conduction band minimum in red. So when you add extra electrons into the system, normally through doping, you end up occupying the bottom of the conduction band and Dave, filling Dave, it up. Just, yeah. Sorry, just interrupt. I'm not seeing the slides moving on. So is it in presentation mode? It is in presentation mode, yeah. Exactly. I don't I can't see them either. I just see the in non in no pre, non presentation mode. Ah, okay. Let me just end that again, try again. So have you seen any slides yet? We see the slides, but just that it was in the it was still on now the opening I think slide. It's okay. Now it's fine. It's now. okay now. Yeah. you you can see a red conduction band on the right. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. good now, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um so when you inject electrons into these systems, when you add uh, donor dopants to add extra electrons in the system, then you fill up the bottom of the conduction band um, and you get what's called a Moss Burstein shift. And this increases the optical band gap and makes the optical band gap actually bigger than the fundamental band gap, e.g. Um, one caveat that you need when you're trying to design a new transparent conducting oxide is that obviously when you have so many electrons occupying the bottom of your conduction band, and um, then if light is still hitting your, your material, then it could possibly excite these extra electrons into low-lying uh, unoccupied states, and that would reduce your optical transparency. So your second caveat is that you need a large separation between the conduction band minimum of the material and the next lowest conduction band. So these materials, zinc oxide, tin dioxide, and indium oxide, all have the ideal electronic structure where they can maintain transparency while being highly defective. So obviously these materials display good conductivity. They normally have carrier concentrations greater than 10 to the 20 per centimeter cubed, and they have conductivities as high as 10 to the four. Now the conductivity of a metal is normally around 10 to the six, so we're getting quite close to metallic conductivity. And these are two pictures that I like to show undergrads when I'm teaching them, because the picture on the left is, uh, I would say, what a concert looked like when um, I was young. Um, but on the right, this is what a concert looks like now. So people don't go and just dance, they go and film, and every one of their devices contains a transparent conducting oxide and also contains a battery. So that shows you the, the rise of technology. So conductivity in transparent conducting oxides is controlled primarily by defects, and they can be intrinsic defects, ones that are native to the material, or extrinsic defects where you add in um, impurities which can add charge carriers. Um, and for n-type transparent conducting oxides, which most of the industry materials are, you are looking for donor defects. So you're looking for defects that will add an extra electron into the system. So typically for intrinsic defects, these would be oxygen vacancies or cation interstitials, or if you're trying to add uh, an impurity, then you're looking for donor dopants. Um, Typically, you want to avoid materials where there are p-type defects in high concentrations, because obviously every p-type defect that you have will uh, form a hole which will kill the electrons in your system. And what's vital is that you have good curvature or dispersion of the bottom of the conduction band, because if your electrons are going to be flying around your conduction band, a uh, uh, high curvature means a low carrier effective mask, which means a high mobility. And of course, you need a high mobility to get high, um, high conductivities. So typically, when we look for these type of uh, systems, we look at the behavior of different dopants in a system and how we, then we characterize each of these dopants as either deep donors, shallow donors, or resonant donors, as we show here on the right. Um, so let's get a so a deep defect is any uh, defect that is further than um, KT from the band edge, so further than 0 0.025 electron volts. Um, a shallow defect is anything that's within KT of uh, a band edge. So basically at room temperature, this um, defect will be able to excite its electron from the defect level into the conduction band. Or ideally, you'd like a resonant defect, one where the defect injects directly into the conduction band, meaning that you already make a metal. 
So we had been working on the defect chemistry of transparent conducting oxides for basically the last 10 years. And just when you think that we understand everything about these systems and that we can explain everything, then uh, you go and find something that really just throws everything off kilter. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and um, which is a new understanding of defects in these systems. So when we think about the transparent conducting oxide market, we can see that it, it's growing at a, a very fast rate. So 17% annual growth rate. Um, and it's going to be worth about 8.04 billion by 2022, according to the most recent market um, analysis. But currently, tin doped indium oxide, or ITO, um, and amorphous indium gallium zinc oxide, called IGZO, they dominate the transparent display in TFT um, industries. And they, they're very useful materials, but this dominance is really a problem because ITO use actually accounts for 60% of the transparent conducting market and also 60% of the global indium use. Now, indium is not a very uh, abundant material, it's quite rare, and often it is located in places that you would describe as geopolitically unstable. So actually getting access to indium is an issue. And what this has meant is that there have been large fluctuations in the cost of indium over the past 10 to 20 years. And of course, from an industrial point of view, this isn't brilliant because you'd like to be able to, to set your profit margins and know what's going to happen. And maybe you could predict a, a, a rise or a fall over time, but you don't want to have this rapid oscillation in the price. So this has meant that um, there's been a pressing need to try to either reduce indium or replace it altogether with an earth, an earth abundant alternative. So in my lab, we're looking at how we can improve transparent conducting oxides or how we can move the field forward. And we have two kind of open questions. So the first one is, are there alternative TCOs out there that we just haven't discovered yet? And are we actually getting the maximum performance out of the current TCOs? Have we maxed them out? Is this the best we can do or can we push it forward? So in our group, we have two basically plans of attack. First one is identify an alternative wide band gap system and see can it be doped to become a transparent conducting oxide. I'm not going to talk about that today, but we have a lot of nice, interesting new systems which we're doing. So we've actually predicted two new TCOs, but they're currently being patented, so we can't talk about them. <clears throat> but the other thing we're doing is we're trying to identify better dopants for the current TCOs because it seems that the field might have become slightly static and just decided that the ones that they had were good enough, but we decided to look beyond that. So when you think about choosing a dopant um, for a TCO or actually for any type of application, typically what would happen is if you're trying to dope, say, tin dioxide, see I've highlighted tin and oxygen here in the periodic table, you would go one to the right in the periodic table. So if, if you were going to find a donor dopant for oxygen, you'd dope with fluorine. Or if you're trying to dope on the tin four plus site, you'd use antimony five plus. So generally you just always just look one to the right of the periodic table because you know that that's going to have an extra electron and you also know it's going to be about the same size as the dopant atom that it's replacing. Similarly for zinc oxide, if you wanted to dope zinc oxide n-type, you'd go one to the right for either aluminium, gallium or indium, or you go if on the oxygen site one to the right for fluorine. And this is what we've conventionally done for, for generations, but is this actually the right approach? So I would like to say that we designed this from the start with this in mind, but actually we, we stumbled upon this problem. So in 2015, um, the Dean of the Maths faculty in UCL came to me and said, we've made some molybdenum doped indium oxide and I'd like you to do some calculations. And of course, as a, as a lecturer at the time, when the Dean asks you to do something, you go, yes, sir, I'll do that. So we did some calculations and we did had a look in the literature. And what we found was that Previously, people had thought that molybdenum was going into the indium oxide matrix as molybdenum 6 plus. So this would have been a 6 plus dopant on an indium 3 plus site, so donating three electrons per dopant. So this didn't make any sense to us because if you were donating three electrons per dopant, you really wouldn't have high conductivity because your mobility would be ruined by impurity scattering. So we did our DFT analysis, we did some X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and we did some XAFs, and we showed that it was molybdenum 4 plus. So it was acting as a one electron donor. Um, 
And then we'd characterize all of the CBD films, which had been grown in UCL. And what we kept finding was that IMO, which is what we call malignant duct indium oxide, was outperforming ITO. So this was a strange one because we had just shown that molybdenum was a four plus dopant. So it's a one electron donor, similar to tin, because tin goes in as tin four plus. Um, but anytime we examined the electron mobility, what we found is that the electron mobility was much higher than for ITO, but also that it was actually breaking um, conventional behavior because it's um, it was actually showing higher mobilities than you'd expect from what's called the normal ionized impurity scattering limit. So we applied to EPSRC and got some funding to look into this. And we did an analysis of IMO. We, we took uh, got metadata from every single molybdenum doped indium oxide paper that we could find in the literature and most of the uh, tin doped indium oxide literature as well. And what we found, and it's plotted down here in, in, on, on the left in terms of resistivity and the right in terms of mobility, is that you can see that the resistivity for IMO is always lower than ITO and the, the mobility is always higher, um, which was quite puzzling. And in fact, there are many papers which have actually shown this, but they seem to have been ignored and treated as chemical curiosities, while industry didn't even bat an eyelid and just kept looking at tin as the ideal dopant. Um, so this asks, it begs some questions for us. Why is molybdenum behaving differently than tin? Why are you getting this increase in performance? Um, what is the origin for this strange behavior? So we started to look a little bit deeper and we looked at the optical transparencies of these systems. And what we could see is that the plasma edge for IMO actually begins much further into the IOR than you'd see for ITO. And so this means that IMO is not only more conductive, but it actually has a larger optical transmission for the same dopant concentrations. So this is definitely proof that something unusual is happening when you stick molybdenum into indium oxide. And um, we could plot a Hackett figure of merit, which is simply the transmission to the power 10 over the sheet resistance. And what you can see is that for similar um, film thicknesses, you end up with conductivities, or sorry, figure of merits for um, IMO, which can be up to twice as good as the figure of merit for ITO. So definitely this is it, outperforming ITO, and it's definitely showing different properties. But, but what's going on? So our collaborators in Liverpool, led by Professor Tim Veal, did some really nice optical analysis where they um, just plotted the optical band gap against the plasma energy. And then they fit that data to uh, get the carrier uh, effective mass at the bottom of the conduction band. So basically a measure of the curvature of the conduction band. To model the data for IMO, you could model it with a rigid, small carrier effective mass of 0.22 um, times the mass of the electron. But to actually model the data for ITO, you had to use an incremental increase in the conduction band effective mass. So 0.22 going to 0.4 times the mass of the electron. So what that tells you is that as you increase the carrier concentration of molybdenum in your IMO, your carrier effective mass isn't changing. But as you increase the carrier concentration of tin in your ITO, your carrier effective mass is getting bigger, which means your mobility is getting worse. So this is where we came in. We are a primarily computational chemistry group and, and we specialize in understanding defects in these types of systems. So to remind you of what the structure of indium oxide, it's a cubic Bixbyite structure. So IA3 bar, um, very large unit cell, 80 atoms in the conventional unit cell. There are two different types of indium environment. Um, one is a uh, nearly perfectly uh, octahedral position, the 8B, which uh, is a very regular octahedra. And then the 24D is a much more distorted octahedra. Um, so we can calculate the formation energy of these, uh, the, the incorporation of molybdenum into the indium oxide system and compare it to tin on an indium side and also some native defects. And so these type of diagrams show formation energy on the y-axis and they show Fermi energy on the x-axis, ranging from zero, which is the valence band maximum, to this orange position, which is the conduction band minimum. And what we can see is that when you dope tin onto an indium site, 
the line slopes upwards from left to right, indicating that it's an n-type defect. And this charge transition level occurs well into the conduction band. So it's a degenerate semiconductor injecting an electron directly into the conduction band. For molybdenum, we actually see two different types of behavior. On the 8B site, this is what we would call a deep donor. So the charge transition level occurs before the conduction band. So it's not injecting directly into the conduction band. But slightly lower in energy, we have this green line, which is molybdenum on the 24D site. So when you incorporate molybdenum onto the 24D site, which it should preferentially do because it's lower in energy, then it actually acts as a, a, a resonant donor. So we can see from this picture that molybdenum might is, is around, it was pretty close to being as soluble in um, indium oxide as tin and behaves similarly in that it, it injects an electron directly into the conduction band. So in our 2015 study, we had actually done some um, XAFs analysis to look at the local environments around the molybdenums. And of course, our calculations um, in this later study showed that we had a, a very good ma match. So when molybdenum is fully ionized, which you can see it is here, it's in the one plus charge state when it's on it, it's showing this upwards um, left to right slope. Then you end up with a, a, an average molybdenum to oxygen bond length of about 2.06, which matches very well with the uh, experimentally seen 2.05. So to understand what molybdenum actually does when you incorporate it into the indium oxide matrix, we can take our supercells and unfold the band structures back onto the band structure of the primitive cell of indium oxide. So this is what is plotted on the right. Um, so when we stick molybdenum onto the 24D site, molybdenum is four plus. So you have a formerly D2 cation, two occupied D states in the middle of the band gap, and one occupied D state just above the bottom of the conduction band minimum. When you ionize that defect, so when the electron that is attached to that defect is basically off somewhere doing some uh, zipping around conducting, you end up with uh, these two occupied D states are stabilized downwards in energy, and this unoccupied D state is destabilized upwards in energy. You get a slightly different picture for the 8B site, because when you stick molybdenum in here, you end up with three occupied D states in the middle of the band gap, which would make it formula, formally molybdenum three plus, um, formally D3. Um, but still, when you ionize that defect, you end up with a similar picture than what we saw for the ionized molybdenum 24D site, where you have two states which are stabilized and one state which is destabilized. Um, so what's happening with these D states? And now this puzzled us for a long time. And then once when I was walking to give an undergraduate inorganic chemistry tutorial in second year, which was on molecular orbital diagrams, I realized that the answer had been staring me in the face. And it was the type of analysis that as an undergrad, I thought I would never use in the real world. Um, so if we think about what happens when you have molybdenum in an octahedral um, site, in the indium oxide matrix. So blue is the valence band, orange is the conduction band. And this MOO6 octahedra, you'd end up with um, the, these three T2G non-bonding states, which is what you would see in the middle of the conduction band for the 8B site, which is the undistorted site. When you go to the 24D site, because it's distorted, in effect, it acts like a Jan Teller distortion. So you have two of the D states are pushed downwards in energy, and these are occupied, and then one is destabilized upwards in it, up, uh, upwards in energy, and then the electron drops from this uh, state into the bottom of the conduction band because obviously the electron wants to lower its its energy. And then when you go to the ionized state, the plus one state, when the electron is basically removed, you end up getting a contraction of the bond lengths, which we saw from our uh, XFs analysis. And this, of course, stabilizes the two occupied states and destabilizes the, um, the unoccupied state, yielding the, 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 the result that we saw from our band structure, which was two D states deep in the band gap and one unoccupied D state far above the bottom of the conduction band minimum. So, of course, at this point, you start to think, is this just an artifact of the calculations and the level of theory that we're employing? 
Um, so we went to Diamond. I'm also a joint appointment at Diamond Light Source, which is the UK's national synchrotron. Um, so we went to IO9, which is the hard XPS beamline. Um, and we talked to Dr. Tian Lin Li, who's the, the guy who built that beamline. And we asked him, could we do some experiments on our thin films of both molybdenum doped indium oxide and tin doped indium oxide? Um, so the hack space showed straight away that the molybdenum was in the four plus oxidation state, but actually we could see in the band gap these molybdenum states, these two occupied states that we had predicted from the calculations. And then we went to Liverpool and we did inverse photo emission spectroscopy and we could see the unoccupied D states at around 2.2 electron volts above the conduction band minimum. We also did some XAS result, um, spectroscopy, which I, I haven't shown here, um, with um, Lewis Piper, who's just moved to Warwick, but at the time was at Sunny Binghamton. Um, and we also saw that the unoccupied D states in above the conduction band. So we had spectroscopic evidence that our calculations uh, were giving us the right answer and were predicting the, the correct behavior. And what hard XPS allows you to do, so remember hard XPS is where you, you basically, it's XPS with a much uh, stronger um, photon energy. So when you do hard XPS, you can actually look a lot closer at the occupation at the bottom of the conduction mat. Um, and what we could see from our spectra was that the ITO peak had a higher peak intensity, but was narrower than the molybdenum doped indium oxide. And of course, a density of states, which this effectively is, is simply an integration of a band structure. So the higher the intensity of the ITO is linked to um, a, a less dispersed conduction band minimum, whereas the, 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 um, the, the broader peak for the IMO is indicative of a higher curvature. Um, so what we can say is that the higher intensity for the ITO is linked to the hybridization of tin S states to the bottom of the conduction band. So we went back to our dean and said, this is what we've done. Isn't this analysis great? And of course, he said, immediately thought, what are the um, possibilities in terms of industry? Is IMO able to do the same things that ITO can do? So we carried out a number of dur durability tests. Um, where we looked at the sheet resistance and the transmission and analyzed them over multiples of each test. And what we can see from these diagrams at the bottom is that um, CVD grown IMO can basically withstand the same general wear and tear and environmental conditions as ITO can with basically the same performance. So from our point of view, there are no barriers to the widespread adoption of IMO as a superior replacement to ITO. So we come back to our kind of cartoon of what's happening here. You have, um, when you dope a molybdenum, you get two deep defect states in the middle of the band gap, and you get one uh, unoccupied state, which is high above the bottom of the conduction band. You get no mixing of the molybdenum D states with the conduction band, meaning that as you increase the carrier concentration, your carrier effective mass stays the same. So you maintain a high mobility. Whereas when you look at the picture for tin, if you incorporate tin into the system, as you increase the, the uh, concentration of tin, the tin S states mix with the indium S states at the bottom of the conduction band, broadening this conduction band and giving you gradually a worse um, mobility as you increase the, the carrier concentration. So to conclude the first section of this talk, I hope that I have now convinced you that IMO is superior to ITO in terms of resistivity and transparency. What our analysis has shown is that thinner films of IMO can be used, which will basically give the exact same performance as a thicker ITO film. And basically, you can half the thickness and get the same performance, which we believe is a potential game changer for industry because you can just use half of the indium. Um, but what it's also did was it provided us with design principles for dopants in other transparent conducting oxides. So what we now know is that if you want to find a dopant for a TCO, that has this type of what we call remote um, impurity doping. You want a transition metal dopant with donor D states that do not hybridize with the cation S states. So you want these D states to be high above the bottom of the conduction band minimum. Ideally, you want a one electron donor because any if you're uh, donating uh, more than one electron, you're gonna get killed by ionized impurity scattering. Um, 
And so we started to think, can we take that understanding and can we find an optimal dopant for a non-Indian based TCO? Because obviously, as I said, um, industry would really like if we could make a higher performing um, TCO that wasn't Indian based. So we started to think, what's the best dopant for tin dioxide? So FTO and uh, ATO and timidy doped tin dioxide are, are very well known as TCOs and um, with resistivities that can come down to the order of around five times 10 to the minus four. And FTO is actually the TCO which is most used for large area applications. So Pilkington Glass or Pilkington NSG as they're now called are a big uh, glass coating company and they coat basically 14 football pitches of glass a day with fluorine when they're running that that line in their big factory in Latham, which is in the north of England. Um, and they came to us and they basically said, we've been using FTO for basically 50 years and we'd like to know, is there anything better or is there anything we can do better? So we started to look at tin dioxide quite closely and we found that when you increase the carrier concentration of either fluorine or antimony in these systems, then you get an increase, an increase in the performance up to a certain point um, and once you're beyond this kind of critical concentration, you start to see a tail off in performance. So we did a lot of calculations and measurements, and we showed that for fluorine doped tin dioxide, that this is caused by the formation of fluorine interstitials. So as you dope normally, you get fluorine going on the oxygen site, which is a, a one electron donor, and this increases the conductivity. But once you go beyond a certain critical concentration, you start to form fluorine interstitials, which end up trapping charge and killing the conductivity. Similarly, for tin doping or for antimony doping of tin dioxide, you get antimony three plus formation at the surfaces. Um, and also, if you have antimony dopants near oxygen vacancies, you can chop charge as well. So, and, and as you increase the, the conductivity um, and increase the carrier concentration, eventually you end up getting a tail off there as well. So, we did uh, an analysis of all other dopants that could be trialed in tin dioxide. So we looked at other five plus cations, including tantalum and um, niobium. And what we found is that quickly tantalum emerged as the front runner. So you can see from our um, diagram down here that tantalum is just as easy to put on a tin site as antimony is. It does trap charge um, once you go a certain distance above the bottom of the conduction band, but as do all dopants in the system. So it has a self-compensation mechanism similar to fluorine and similar to um, antimony, but it is just as, uh, just as easy to get into the system. And when we looked at the band structure, we saw exactly what we wanted to see. We saw D states, which were high above the bottom of the conduction band minimum, meaning that we have the exact same behavior that we had for molybdenum in um, indium oxide, just without those occupied D states in the middle of the band gap. So once you stick tantalum into the tin dioxide matrix, you end up getting a very um, nice donor state high above the bottom of the conduction band. It does not um, mix with the bottom of the conduction band, meaning that you should be able to maintain high mobility as you increase the carrier concentration. So we did the similar analysis that we had done for uh, molybdenum doped indium oxide, and we checked every single previous paper on tantalum doped tin dioxide. And here we compare it to antimony doped tin dioxide. And what you can see is straight away, the, the, we actually knew the answer to this problem. Tantalum has much higher mobilities historically than um, antimony doped tin dioxide. But again, because it was just isolated papers that were pretty much not in great journals, this finding was just pretty much ignored. But in actual fact, what this proves is that tantalum is the optimal dopant for tin dioxide. So we did our standard analysis looking at the optical transparency and what we could see is that, um, again, similar to what we saw from molybdenum doped indium oxide, we have higher transparency in the IOR um, and we have uh, basically uh, much um, lower effective mass than you have for tantalum or for antimony doped tin dioxide. So we can do lots of analysis looking at using the uh, XPS data that we took on this 
So we could plot the Fermi energy versus the, um, the valence band over the carrier concentration. And then if we fit that, what you find is that the, um, the carrier, the curvature of the conduction band minimum for um, tantalum doped tin dioxide is of course lower than that of um, ATO. And again, the similar schematic to what we saw before, when we uh, dope with uh, antimony or if we dope with fluorine, then we have a broadening of the bottom of the conduction band, giving you a, a, a worse um, mobility and a worse conductivity. Whereas when we dope with tantalum, we maintain our high mobility and maintain a higher conductivity. So the, the conclusions to this last part of the talk, Tato, as my co colleagues keep calling it, because of course I'm Irish and they think this is hilarious, Tato is a superior dopant to FTO and ATO in terms of mobility and conductivities. The interesting thing is because you have this superior IR transparency, you have the possibility to avoid lots of parasitic loss in the IR that actually you see in solar cells. So it's very interesting to try Tato and a range of photovoltaic devices, and this is currently something that's being done by collaborators and other people who have obviously read our paper and contacted us. Um, but we, we did it, we wrote a, a nice paper on this in Chemistry and Materials this year, published, uh, or last year now, we're 2021, I keep forgetting because of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, so Tato is by far the, um, the optimal dopant for tin dioxide, and we believe it now should be adopted for um, all of these wide, large area um, TCO applications. So I need to acknowledge my former postdoc, Ben Williamson, who was at UCL and is now a postdoc at NTNU in Trondheim. Dr. Sanjay Satasivam, who was working with Professor Claire Carmont and Ivan Parkin at UCL and grew all the, all the, the films. Jack uh, and the team at Liverpool who worked for Professor Tim Veal. Mark Farnworth and Paul Warren, who um, gave us all of their industry knowledge um, from Pilkington NSG. Anna Ragutz, who's now at UCL, and Tian Lin for doing a lot of the hard XPS analysis. And Zach and Lewis Piper for um, analyzing the XAS spectrum. We are a computational chemistry group. We couldn't do any of this without the excellent computational resources we have at UCL, um, including the three supercomputers, Myriad, Grace, and Kathleen, and then the Thomas Young machines, which are provided by the MMM hub, but also access to the Archer machines, which are provided via our membership of the Materials Chemistry Consortium. And of course, I have to thank all of the funding bodies who make the research that we do possible. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, David. That's, that was a very interesting talk. So we have a, a couple of questions. Um, so I suppose I'll just kick off. Um, what are the the broader implications of the work? Like, let's say, can it be extended to other transition metals, lanthanides? Is there a, a wider scope? So yeah, this is this is where a lot of the research in my lab is going at the moment. Um, basically, depending on what the property is that you want, if you really want a high mobility dopant, then looking beyond the conventional dopant strategy for uh, many different applications is the right way to go. And um, so we're currently trying to predict new transparent conducting oxides. We have two of them and we can dope them conventionally and we get the type of behavior we'd expect. But now we're looking for these non-conventional dopants by trying to find transition metals that we can put in there and we're getting higher conductivities and higher performance. So it, it's, it's not just um, limited to the oxides that we've limit, we've listed here. We can show conclusively that if you dope zinc oxide with scandium, it'll perform better than if you dope it with aluminium or gallium. Um, but we're also using it in the thermoelectrics field because um, oftentimes you would like to have a higher mobility without losing your, your, your conductivity from the ionized impurity scattering. So it's working in that, that, that field as well. Um, we haven't gone beyond anything that where you need a conducting oxide, um, but we suspect it would work for non-oxides as well. You just have to choose your dopant wisely. Okay, um, very, very good. So there's another question. Um, in terms of the feasibility of using this uh, computationally derived 
process for organic uh, based materials? So, I mean, that's that's a great question. And I'm not an expert in doing organic calculations, but we have been talking with some of our colleagues in UCL who do organic calculations about how to predict this type of behavior, but we don't really see how you would you don't really have a band structure in an organic solid, right? In the way that we have in these. You, I mean, even trying to understand the crystal structure of an organic solid is quite difficult in itself. And it's probably, a, um, it's, it is an entire field in itself. Um, I'm not certain, I, I'll be honest, I would love to see if you could do it and I'd love to try it. <laughs> um, so if somebody wants to contact me about trying to, to think about how we would do that, I'd be, I'd be very open to it. Um, but yeah, I just don't know enough to say yes or no if it would work. Okay, and and it's good. There's one final question then. Um, someone asked for more detail on the DFT calculations. Is there any particular functional or Van der Waals corrections? Yeah, so basically these are hybrid DFT calculations because obviously we wanted to get to, to do this type of defect analysis and to understand the band structure you have to have a reasonably accurate description of the electronic structure. So for the indium oxide stuff, we use the HSE06 functional because that yields uh, a band gap and band structure in good agreement with the experiment. Um, and for the tin dioxide stuff, we use the PBE0 functional, um, which yields pretty much the exact band gap for tin dioxide. All of these calculations are done in the VASP code, um, which is a, a um, periodic DFT code which is available um, but you have to pay for a license, so it's proprietary. Um, and they're, they're just standard defect calculations. If anyone's interested in, in understanding how to do this, I would be happy to talk to them afterwards or talk to them offline. Okay, okay David, so I think, I think we'll finish there. Um, so thanks again for, for your talk. Obviously, we, we don't have a round of applause, but we're-, we're... If you could start sharing your screen, and David, if um, you could start sharing yours, thanks. Yeah, yeah no problem. Okay, so that, that's great. So, um, our second speaker um, in this session then is uh, Professor Oshi Vangert. Um, so um, Oshi is a, a Bernal Chair um, in the Department of Physics um, and she works in the area of electron microscopy um, and um, has uh, made some very important developments in the area of graphene and also in terms of aberration corrected electron microscopy. So over to you Oshi for, for your talk. Yeah, give it one sec now, just share a screen. I hope it is the right screen <laughs> because I have too many things open, sorry. Uh, there we go. I can't see anything. Yeah, your screen is up your shoes, so you can just begin if you'd like. Can you see my pointer? Yes, yeah, perfect. Okay, um, right, so, one sec. So I want to inform about um, high-end, uh, top of the world, <laughs> the top of the range elect uh, characterization of materials via transmission electron microscopy and spectroscopy. And this can be applied to any materials, but I'm gearing it or I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on, on ferro, uh, sorry, on um, optoelectronic materials uh, and quantum, uh, using quantum, new quantum technologies and information technology. Okay, so just a quick uh, showing of my group. Uh, this was a few years ago, now we have many more members and uh, also collaborators in quite world-renowned centers, SuperSTEM in, 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 in the UK, in Trinity, and also the collaborators I have on, on common project, on, on, on projects. Uh, funded funding projects with Queens, Nebraska and Germany, German institutions. So I just want to say, um, introduce or show the the instrument that we have. It is um, one of literally one of a handful in its constellation, one of a handful in the world. It's a uh, Titan Themis with monochromated, double corrected with uh, uh, detect very sensitive detection capabilities. So cameras, very ultra fast and ultra sensitive cameras, can do scanning, can be used in scanning mode and has can we, we can do EDX and also energy loss spectroscopy. And this is the latter one at 30 milli electron uh, volt resolution, which is very, uh, is very unusual. And also I didn't mention this here, we can do this at a, a spatial resolution of uh, the on the angstrom level. 
Okay. So, sorry. Okay. The fact, uh, the reason why this instrument is one of a few in the world is because we added all this uh, in situ equipment. So, um, thanks to the SFI for funding of the grants and also to give us an older TM to where we can do uh, preliminary experiments. So, so pre-check samples before we put them in this uh, highly, uh, uh, highly advanced instrument, the Titan. So we have uh, holders um, in which we can do element uh, in, um, investigations in liquids. So the ocean stream all, and you can see, I think you can see this is actually an a movie here of uh, crystal growth so it starts again uh, of pharma because we have a pharma a project with pharma industry so uh, this is the, the the research on this is dr cookman so we can actually observe crystal growth in pharma crystals and here on this side we have also got um, uh, um, lightning and the uh, uh, um, uh, heating and sorry, sorry yes lightning holder is called it's a heating and biasing holder and here uh, on this side we show I'm showing a, a, a movie of um, polymer growth uh, research going on in Dr. Scannon's group, uh, carried out by, this was carried out by uh, Dr. Conroy. And here we see, um, again, it looks like a sort of fold in a, in a, in a material, in a tech, uh, textile, but it is actually a domain change, a domain wall in ferroelectrics. And if we zoom, and this is done, this is actually, sorry, it's, 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 it's a phase change, it's a phase change. It's, it's a, between two different phases, and this is due to heating, um, to, to heating here. And this is, uh, if you zoom in, we can see this on the atomic scale, so we can actually see, you know, the change in the atom positions and so forth. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is two, uh, I address two topics. One is uh, 2D uh, mono characterization of 2D entities in quantum technology. So one is 2D monolayers in transition metal dichrogenides, and the next one is a ferroelectric dom domain wall. So I'm going to go start with the first one. Uh, 2D materials have risen extreme attention and they're sort of um, now trying to be uh, um, um, tailored and, and employed in all sorts of quantum and, 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 and in optoelectronic materials in IT and so forth. So I'm just showing uh, uh, what we are dealing with Transition. I'm dealing in this talk with some, uh, transition metal dichrogenides, monolayers thereof. Just showing a, a sketch here. The uh, blue atoms are the uh, um, transition metals, the yellow atoms, the chalcogen. So side view. This is a layer of, of um, transition metals, uh, both sides bordered or um, and, and cups <laughs> and cups that if you also in uh, with with uh, uh, chalcogens. And the big new thing is to actually make heterostructures of so uh, building an atomic Lego, call it. And what we are doing uh, in in terms of uh, novel, uh, um, adding novel stuff to this is we optoelectronically tailor these 2Ds by ion implantation. Now ion implantation is a is a is an extremely important method that was used for de for decades. And without this one, we could wouldn't have information technology and all the optoelectronic devices we have now. And so we, I, we want to explain to, to employ this now for uh, 2Ds. And when I first tried this and first started this, I was told this is absolute rubbish. You can't do it. We can never implant in a in a in a in a, in a single atom sheet. And but but we have shown now that it's possible if you have low enough energies. So we don't only want. It's first of all, it's it's a very um, um, precise method, and you cannot. Sorry. You cannot achieve that uh, with chemical uh, doping or so. So I also want to do it in in a. In a, a sculpt, in nano sculpting, so <clears throat> in a very, very uh, localized way, so just in nanometer way, we want to make quantum dots or single photonometers. Here I'm showing some sort of um, um, sketch how to achieve that. And um, but in order to see whether this is actually uh, effective or, or, or successful, we have to uh, uh, literally assess these things. Uh, the, the what's happening. Uh, by atomic resolution uh, methods. So, so we want to control and introduce the impurities into 2Ds to tailor the band gaps, for example, at the atomic scale. And as I said, I think I mentioned we want to make single photon emitters, but we need to know, is this really true? What Can we achieve it? What happens to the implanted atoms? And here I'm showing a high resolution image, uh, atomic resolution image of 
um, molybdenum disulfide, which is impl implanted with selenium. And what we can see is where the arrows point to implantation sites. There's also other uh, bright atoms, which is uh, contamination. And an enlargement of this shows, in fact, so we have this um, molybdenum, this is the hexagonal structure here. This molybdenum, this is cell, uh, uh, sulfur, it's lower in Z, so that has lower contrast, molybdenum, sulfur molybdenum, so it's a hexagon with a varying or um, intensity. But here we see there is actually where should be a sulfur, a darker spot, a darker intensity spot. It's actually a bright spot, and this is an implant. We can see an in, in, in individual implant of selenium in, um, in this material. Now we need to obviously um, prove that this is right, what we're seeing. How can we prove it? We can just assume it is like this. No, we, we prove it. Here I'm showing again this, and I'm just enlarging an area. So, um, for example, I'm just uh, looking, pointing at a few positions in that enlarged uh, um, area here. So there is a bright atom where there should be a dark one. So these are the experimental images. What I'm showing here are the uh, simulated images. And that's how we prove that it's right what you're seeing. So this is a, a selenium implanted on a, uh, on a sulfur site. Then we get number two. So again, here we have a darker atom where it should be bright. If we have actually a selenium implanted or integrated into molybdenum site here, then we have a very bright atom. This is just an other atom of selenium. And then we have a dark atom, which is a vacancy. And how do we know? So this is uh, the image simulations. And we can actually show, this is now the proof that we see what, what the interpret here is right. We can actually quantify this by taking intensity profiles. For example, across this region here, where we have this um, a substitutional selenium atom, and we can see that the actual in experimental intensity profile here, these two uh, um, humps here, are very, very similar, totally agree in numbers and so forth with the uh, simulated ones. So that is um, um, proof that what we are seeing and interpreting is, is right. And it's a lot of data, so we try and we, we now automate the analysis of, of individual atoms. So we have uh, code prismatic stem simulation. It's now open access demo toolkit, toolkit software it's developed by Dr. O'Connell and just showing here um, a raw image. You can see it, you can see the atoms, but it was not very clear. So if we then, so we, if, we, if, we, if we use this um, automatic analyzing um, um, program, then we can see when we filter the data, we can see this and we can actually see already there's differences in, in, in intensities in the atoms. And then we can extract from this, again through this toolkit, the atomic lattice, so we get the, the type of atoms and their positions. We extract this and we can see it's quite complex, so the implanted atoms are not just sitting on, 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 on substitutional uh, sites, but they're also sort of shifted around. And this thing can be actually done in three dimensions, so if we turn it around, we can actually see sideways and we can see it's not just all in the actual uh, uh, layer itself, it's also add atoms and so forth. And so then further, we can go further, we can actually take movies, so we can actually study the dynamics of these uh, 2D, 2D materials and substitutional defects, add atoms and so forth. And um, so basically these are the raw data, we filter them now. This is a, a series of image, obviously to make a movie, and we use this package I've just described uh, to, to filter it out, and then we simulate. So in, for each frame, we, we make a simulation, and then we can see that it's very well um, sort of uh, agreeable with this. For example, if you look at this atom, it's wobbling about. It's a brighter atom, it's a selenium. It's here as well, so it's actually uh, it's 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 on its it stays on its place, but it's just wobbles about to so the electron beam. But we can also see other ones that are jumping about from one position into another, so exchanging places with other uh, atoms, and this is exactly the same on this side. So we have very good uh, um, agreement with this. The last uh, um, uh, further um, topic we're addressing is strain. So we're actually uh, um, uh, uh, getting strain maps and over this over a strain map here. This is strain. Uh, this is the color scheme for the for the strain values, and we overlay them on the actual uh, image. We can see it is actually predicted that um, um, the implants create uh, positions of higher strain and thereby can, can actually uh, uh, enable single photo emission because they change the band gap, they make it, uh, they reduce the direct band gap. So, and we can actually see, yes, where the red 
uh, positive strain is where the red places are, and this is, for example, where the implants are. So we can actually see it's true that they actually introduce strain. Okay, so I'm just going to the second uh, thing I want to talk about. The second topic is ferroelectric domain walls. Why do we look at this? Um, well, domain walls. Uh, is, Oshi, Oshi, just interrupt. We've about four minutes left just for. I just oh, no. I thought it was more than that. Oh, gosh. Oh, dear. Right, so and I have to really race through this now. Uh, it's used for agile nano, uh, nano electronics. Um, this is the domain world seeing that we can actually see it move under electric field in optical and uh, scanning microscopy. And just to combine it with what I talked about, you can combine what I've talked about before, making these quantum devices. And if they're conducting domain worlds, you can actually move them across and switch individual devices on and off, which is wouldn't be possible if we do it um, um, with other contacting methods. So I just want to show here is um, a um, uh, boracite with two domains and there's a domain wall. Can one see it? Not in this picture, but if we put a user program which uh, take um, um, visualizes the shifts of the atoms, we can actually see that, yes, there is a polarization here. The atoms go downwards in this in this let's plan here the atoms go to the right so they're making polarizations of the wall and this is uh, another type of imaging revealing the lighter atoms so we can also do this now um, in in um, uh, look at the dynamics of the domain walls uh, when we actually scan we can actually see that you scan in this direction this is uh, this, this this reveals the orientation of the dipoles. You can see it's different than if we scan it in the different in the other direction. And again, here we have a, perf a per perpendicular domain wall. This is not charged on conducting, but if we use the electron beam and 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 and, and scan it uh, continuously, then we see that the domain wall changes. And this is actually a paper that's. Uh, uh, nature reviews and it's the first and we can do this now on the atomic scale we can just see about the atomic lattice there so we can see we go from a non-conducting to a conducting domain wall and this is the first time this has actually been done uh, internationally here we see individual um, atoms changing their direction their, their dipole directions uh, this is the color scheme for the angular changes and again um, just looking at strain again scanning we can do, reveal strain in domain walls as we if we is as we image, we get uh, here this two domains. There's a domain wall, and after scanning, these domains are actually have constant strain, and then the domain wall becomes very highly strained and end conducting. So uh, again, only a couple of more pictures. Looking at the in, uh, this is in situ biasing now. We we get again um, the domain wall is is moving. And here we have in, in situ heating, we can actually see a phase change and we can see it on the atomic level, the atoms actually change when we go from lower to higher temperature. Uh, skip over this picture and this is doing the same stuff in much more complex materials with, with uh, heterostructures. We can actually see vortices, we can actually see uh, the, 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 the dipole constellations in, in a ring, so vortices and we can do on the atomic scale, as you can see, individual atoms, we can do strain measurements and bending of, of these uh, heterostructures. Just saying, uh, we also do uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, and this is on uh, um, um, atomically resolved electron loss spectroscopy, which, which we can actually get information about the oxidation state of uh, oxygen, uh, oxidation states and titanium. We can actually get literally on atomic level, we can get the information about the uh, band structure. And it's showing it here again. This is really the last slide. So we see, for example, in the domain itself, in the band gap here, there is um, um, sorry, there's uh, less uh, states there, less 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 transitions. Whereas if you're on the domain wall, the conducting, there's more transitions, so there's more band states, interband states. So that can all be revealed on the atomic level. So my summary is: we have not nature. We we reveal the nature of individual atoms. Atomic elements, structure, sites, subatomic shifts, dynamics, that's very important. And we have shown that they're successful. We can successfully implant 2Ds and uh, the electron beam can also be used uh, instead of avoid this. We can actually use it to study the dynamics of 2D quantum entities, again, on the atomic scale. And this is um, <coughs> new insights. These insights are needed, desperately needed to um, 
and they can only be done by, 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 by these methods and code development to actually reveal the, uh, the 2D nature of quantum entities. And final remark, this, re re this, this work actually uh, requires a uh, re re uh, career, uh, sorry, uh, scientists, not just the infrastructure which we have. So we need to f have people that know uh, that very much uh, um, aware and, 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 and uh, um, they know uh, the, the, the research behind it and how to use the uh, the, this to, to apply this to resolve or to, to reveal the material science discoveries. Uh, and then I want to just st uh, thank my group and also financial collaborative and facility support. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ishii. Great. Okay, thanks, Ishii. So um, we've just time for a uh, a couple of questions if they come up. So I have a, a question, Urshi. So uh, it's very interesting in terms of the, the main wall work. Um, so how much of, of that is in terms of, okay, you, you observe that this is the case, but in terms of applying that then in terms of an application, can you actually create these these uh, these domain wall regions as you need them? You know, and so how does that translate, let's say, to uh, I assume it's for storage or, or some sort of uh, memory application, is it? Now that's exactly what we want to find out. So we actually try, and I hope I, I conveyed that, we actually can create them and we can move them. And we can also, if we don't, uh, you know, for example, if we don't apply bias and things like we, we this is what we're just investigating, actually. We, they, they're actually stable, they stay there, and then if we apply bias, they shift and so forth. So yes, we, this is this is part of this project that we actually exactly find, trying to find that out. So we know that we can induce them, that we can move them, that we can make them stationary. We can even uh, erase them, uh, okay. But um, how exactly we do we make a memory device of this? This is the next step, so we don't know that yet. I mean, but, but I assume you mean you can you can do all this in, in a microscope. But I, I assume if it's yes, but we can also externally bias, and so yeah, exactly. We, it's if we're investigating this in the microscope to then also we have shown a picture when when you uh, externally bias it, you know, by by a contact to also make domain walls move. But at the moment we. In the microscope, this is exactly the power of what we do. We want to see whether it's possible, fundamentally possible, to 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 um, you know to uh, to to make the move or to make how how you you find out about individual atomic di atom dynamics. Yeah, but okay, it's the next step. It's the next step to actually <laughs> imply that or make that uh, um, into devices and things like that. It's absolutely, there's an absolute goal, of course. Yeah. Okay. But that's just to, to show you what the microscopy can do to fundamental studies, yeah. Yeah, no, no, very, very interesting. Okay, uh, Oshi, so thanks very much uh, for your talk. And uh, that brings me to close this session. So um, I'd very much like to thank uh, Professor Scanlon and Professor Bangert uh, for two very interesting talks um, um, covering um, computational work for the ITOs and the Indian uh, Indium dope materials for, for David and obviously electron microscopy for, for Oshi. So they're, they're uh, very appropriate to this, this cluster. And I think um, just to remind everybody to go back to the conference hall then for the award ceremony, which will be happening shortly. And the link is in the Q&A there, Kevin. In the Q&A, great.